All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, super excited that you're joining us for FC Build. Uh, since many people are new to FC Build, let me just start with a short introduction to Foundation Capital. Uh, we're a very early stage venture firm, been around for 26 years. We have more than 30 companies um, that have gone public. I'm very proud of that. In our enterprise practice, we've been fortunate to partner with entrepreneurs that are working up and down the enterprise stack from cloud, data, AI automation, DevOps, B2B SaaS, uh, cybersecurity. And we primarily lead seeds and series A's in these categories, uh, usually before a company has any meaningful revenues and sometimes even a product. So basically we invest in dreamers with huge dreams and we try to work with them to make them real. And if that describes you, uh, then please get connected to one of us. And with that, the purpose of this conference is to discuss some of these dreams and to have conversations with, with folks that have done it already, uh, to share nuggets of wisdom and their experiences, which is uh, uh, why I'm super excited to be here with Bill Shu and Paula Hansen today uh, to talk about scaling sales for B2B companies. I'll do very brief introductions for both of them, and I have a bunch of questions. And, and, and folks in the audience, feel free to also ask questions on the side. We'll start with 30 minutes of discussion and leave about 15, 10 or 15 minutes for, for audience questions. Sounds good? Awesome. So Bill is currently CRO of Anna Plan. Uh, he joined earlier this year. Congrats, Bill. Um, and previously was uh, the EVP of global industry sales and Medallia for over five years. Uh, fun fact about Bill, his father was actually a partner of Foundation Capital, so very long, long time friend of the firm's. And Paula Hansen is CRO Alterex after a stint as CRO of SAP Customer Experience and before that VP of Sales at Cisco Enterprise. Congrats, Paula, as well on your new-ish gig. Um, very curious about uh, uh, both of your decisions to join uh, new companies recently. And maybe I'll start off with you, Paula. Why did you leave SAP for Alteryx and, and what was attractive about that opportunity? Yeah, thanks, Joanne. It's great to be here and great to be with you, Bill, and uh, looking forward to the conversation today. So um, I've been fortunate to, to be leading go-to-market and sales teams for, for quite some time. I, I love uh, tech. I love uh, how it enables our customers success. And um, as you can tell from my prior experiences at SAP and, and Cisco, I've been able to lead some really large multi-billion dollar businesses and think about how you continue to always look for the next tranche of growth. Um, and I think from there, I have always uh, wanted to, to see how we might take a, a smaller business and turn it into a multi-billion dollar business, uh, which is definitely what uh, we think we have the opportunity to do here at Alteryx. So uh, in terms of why it was Alteryx specifically among, um, among other uh, great opportunities, it, you know, first was just the market. I think uh, it's always important to be really excited about the market that you serve and to see a great growth opportunity for the business. And I definitely see that in the world of data and analytics. Um, secondly, I was blown away um, by the value that our product delivers to our clients. There was just deep customer loyalty and, and zealots that um, uh, had been built over, over the, the last many years around our product. So that got me pretty excited as well. Um, and then lastly, I just I think that the opportunity will leverage a lot of the experiences that I've had um, up until this point in my career uh, around opening new markets and um, scaling uh, uh, go to market capacity, building partnerships and, and other things. So it just seemed like the right opportunity at the right time. And I'm definitely thrilled to be here. And we're going to dive into all of these experiences in just a little bit. Uh, but we'll first ask Bill uh, this, the same question. Um, how did you think about Anaplan and what, what attracted you to, to this role? And, and how do you think about that in, in contrast with Medallia? Thanks, Joanne. And so good to see you and Paula. Excited for this conversation. I think like Paula, I have a deep passion for technology and how it helps companies solve important business problems and drive business and financial results. And I had known Anaplan prior to joining 
as a technology. I had actually deployed it twice, both at Medallia and before that at a foundation portfolio company, Sunrun. <laughs> and right. so I, I'd had a first row seat to the kind of outcomes it can unlock as organizations connect financial and operational plans that historically have been very disconnected and move data and decision making from edge to edge in the enterprise and from static to real time. So I just on some level, I had a deep passion for for the opportunity the company is pursuing. Um, and like Paula, I also feel like it's a it's a company operating in a in a massive market opportunity. And I came to believe through my own experience and then thinking, uh, thinking more deeply, deeply about the business and the market that connecting plans, decision making and execution will become table stakes for the modern enterprise. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's why I decided to uh, to join the company. That's that's great. Maybe just to give some context, um, do you mind describing the sales org that you are in today? How maybe how's that structured? How many people? Um, what kind of selling motion? And then we'll kind of dive into some some of your experiences. Uh, starting off with with you, Bill. I was going to offer Paula the chance to lead off. <laughs> All right, Paula, you go ahead. <laughs> All right. So um, so we have. Uh, just around 700 people in uh, in the org that I lead across um, sales and marketing uh, and customer success isn't a direct reporting function, but definitely uh, consider it an integral part of the go to market team. Um, we're structured, as you would imagine, from a sales perspective with um, geographic teams to have people you know close to their customers in market uh, we also organize ourselves through segmentation to think about how um, how customers themselves uh, where they sit in the market um, how they like to buy the types of um, engagement models that they expect from us we have uh, demand generation teams uh, both on the marketing side that think about both digital and in-person uh, demand gen capabilities, and then they partner very closely with business development um, that helps sort of follow up on those leads as they're identified. Um, uh, and then, you know, lastly, we have on the on the marketing side as well, you know, brand uh, teams and um, product marketing teams as well, because those are all really critical in terms of, of how we overall approach the market and support our our customers through their buying journey, which I think we're going to talk about how that's evolved. Um, For sure. Over. Actually, maybe on, on that point, maybe you can describe a little bit of the Alteryx customer profile. You know, are they you know typically enterprises? What what, what, what stages? And yeah, so we've um, we've definitely addressed uh, over our years SMB through enterprise, mm -hmm. um, but we've we've you know really pivoted uh, in the last year in particular to the enterprise space because that's where we see the the most, uh, you know, TAM uh, to address. That's where we think the appetite is is highest for the type of innovation that we offer to the market. Um, so we've really oriented our go to market um, for the enterprise space, and then we partner very heavily for mid market and SMB because those are those are the enterprise customers of the future, and and we want to make sure that we're we're also serving them uh, in a cost effective way um, that helps uh, helps their businesses as well. Got it. Got it. How about you, Bill? What's um, what does the for, org look like? Firstly, Paul, it's a great point about what I think of as emerging enterprise and the importance of being intentional about supporting and getting to know the organizations that will be the, the next the next members of the S and P five hundred or the Fortune yeah. five hundred uh, because the composition of those groups has changed so rapidly over the last ten to twenty years. I think it's really remarkable on some level. Joanne, I think Paula did a great job of, of describing structure. Maybe what I could add that I think is adjacent and, and really important uh, to the discussion is, I think both of us probably agree that go to market is a system. Mm -hmm. And so I think the really key thing to think about, you know, if I think about the, the, the founders or potential founders in the audience is how do you organize go to market so it functions effectively as a, as a system? meaning the goals need to be clear and aligned. The, the, the roles and responsibilities across the different piece parts of go to market need to be clear and the, the motions need to reinforce and support one another. So as an example, 
what's the role of customer success in creating a happy customer that's referenceable in the market, which supports the marketing endeavor and makes acquiring customers more efficient and drives down cost of customer acquisition? How does customer success and easy organic expansion, which drives growth and cost of sale, on and on and on? What's the role of the part partner ecosystem by segment in the delivery process? Does the partner ecosystem play a role in renewal or expansion? I think those are the types of questions for founding teams to ask. And as they build and scale, go to market to make sure that um, that it all acts to get acts together as opposed to, to potentially pulling in For slightly sure. different directions. For sure. And I, I, I want to turn these questions on, on to you. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and perhaps you can, you know, you were very early at, at, at Sunrun, which is you know, one of our portfolio companies and kind of saw through the different stages of uh, sizes of organizations. How did you guys make these decisions? Uh, the interplay between the departments at the different, maybe you can give a few examples of what those uh, organizations look like um, at different scales. Yeah, it's a it's a great point, Joanne. And I think I you know I've had so much fun over the course of my career, everything from very early stage to to larger scale. And I think the thought processes do evolve. You know, the, the in the very early stage company, the founder and founders really should be leading a lot of the go to market thinking and and engaging very deeply with with customers because there's so much thinking going on about product market fit. Um, at, then as the company scales, what we tried to do at, at, at Sunrun and certainly try to do effectively at uh, today at Anaplan is have a very clear framework for making decisions. You know, what's the company's long term vision and mission? Uh, how do we measure success from a metric standpoint? And then you use those to, to make the decisions around how to organize, what to invest in and equally what not to do. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think, Paul, you mentioned one of the aspects um, that you guys recently made a decision on is the role of partnerships, right, in serving mid-market. Um, could, could you tell us a bit more about that? I, I was very curious um, how, how that works at your organization. Yeah, I think, you know, partnerships are key for any company of any size when you think about how you serve the market and serve your customers. Um, we have to acknowledge that, you know, we're not a single piece of technology living in any customer environment. Firstly, it's got to integrate into a broader landscape. Um, and, you know, it has to it has to be, uh, you know, positioned to the right buying center at the right time. And so I, I think for us, partnerships have served very well, not only in the S&B and, and mid market where we're, we're looking for them to help us with with reach and with scale, um, but also in the enterprise space when it comes to innovation um, and demonstrating that we, we recognize that the intersection of our technology with other technologies, um, uh, you know, our customers are expecting us to solve those integration opportunities um, and come to them with partnerships that don't put that the, the, the burden on them uh, to making various different pieces of technology work together. So, you know, it, it spans uh, all of those different um, vectors in terms of the value of partnerships. But I would I would submit that you will never hit your uh, growth targets without them. For sure. And how maybe a question related to earlier stage companies and, and partnerships in particular, I mean, how should founders think about partnerships and when does that become you know, very valuable. When did it become valuable for, for Alturex? And, and how do you think about like the introduction of this concept for, for the businesses that are much earlier stage? Yeah. And, and I've seen it not only at Alturex, but I've seen it over the years as we've acquired smaller companies, earlier mm -hmm. stage companies, how they, you know, built their go-to markets. I think partnering early is a good is a good idea for founders and for organizations. Um, you, you have to be deliberate. Like you cannot, you know, up, you cannot turn up uh, dozens of partnerships. But if you can assess, you know, very specifically which partnerships are the most meaningful to your customers and to the market that you serve, 
um, and, and being thoughtful about those, um, then I think they can be really material. I would I would give marketplaces as an example of a, of a fantastic partnership opportunity, mm -hmm. right, for early stage companies and even mature companies, um, because that will access audiences and customer markets that you can't physically address on your own. And then they also start to inform for you the ways that customers think about your solution and where it fits into the into the broader landscape. And that can help um, direct innovation and R&D and, and, you know, other decisions for the company. Absolutely. Bill, any thoughts on any thoughts on that? And in and, 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 um, thinking about early stage uh, des design of, of the sales organization in general? including, you know, success and, and, and partnerships and all the different components. Any, um, any thoughts or advice? Lot, yeah, lots of thoughts and lots of advice. Let me try to pick, let me try to pick one or two points that are relevant. I think maybe I'll start by building on some of Paula's comments, um, which, I, which I think are very well put. You know, I think one of the key things, and, and this remains super important, at almost any scale, but I think it's exceptionally important for early stage companies because time is precious, resources are precious, capital is precious, focus is critically important. So I, I think, in my opinion, a lot of the early work around product market fit is best done directly, unless the company believes it has a fundamentally indirect model to get to market. And then once you, once you start to, to think about selling with or selling through or delivering with partners, I think focus becomes critically important. Think about what the right partner or partners for the business look like and treat them like you would treat a customer. Make sure they are phenomenally successful before you think about expanding a partner ecosystem or doing more, right? I think it's kind of one step at a time and uh, and be really clear on what success looks like. Uh, ab absolutely, and I think the amount of resources for each partner has has to be realistic um, when when startups are considering that, especially in a fairly resource constrained environment. Um, how about you know? There's a lot of talk about um, a different growth model, product like growth, right? Which is very much about um, identifying some of the early signals. Uh, deploy more marketing dollars typically versus versus sales and um, uh, and uh, look looking at that more closely as you think about your efforts. Um, have you guys seen more more of that effort in your organizations? Uh, you know any thoughts on on how effective this motion is? Maybe we'll start off with Paula. Yeah, I, I think product led growth is is an incredibly viable strategy. Uh, Alteryx, I would submit, sort of started uh, with product led growth, right? All about reducing the friction for your customers to get access to your solution. Um, you know, really enabling a self service model, giving uh, them full transparency to your pricing, um, to giving them, you know, all, all the different. Um, assets that they need to evaluate your solution. So I think it's a, a fantastic business model um, and one that frankly, a lot of customers have just come to expect. Uh, what, that, what that means then, as you think about how it fits in with you know, more traditional sort of sales oriented go to market is that those resources you know, can be applied um, to much more kind of complex and strategic engagements with your customer base. Um, because, you know, the customers are, are no longer uh, uninformed on your solution, right? They've done their research, they've done, they've downloaded the software, they've already used it. So, you know, so much of the, the work that would have traditionally been done by a, a sales rep has already been done by the customer before the sales rep is, is even engaged. And so um, this then shifts the focus to helping your customer realize the value of the solution, think about expansion opportunities, um, think about cross-sell, demonstrate back to them that you're really in it for their success, right? Which is where, as Bill referred to, the customer success organization is so important. Um, customers are just really looking for demonstration that you realize that it's not just about the sale, but mm -hmm. that it's about the realization of value and, and really aligning whether it's the commercial structure of your solution to a, a consumption model or a pay-as-you-go or whether it's you know really thinking about um, the the uh, the ways that the customer is going to 
adopt your technology and utilize it more broadly, that's where they want to see, you know, the go to market resources really step up. Uh, absolutely. And and with that, and uh, you know, when you think about hiring for with with that kind of strategy, any considerations there? You know, are there any differences or or different types of people that you look for? Yeah, I mean, I think that the um, the the collaborative um, kind of customer lifetime value mindset is really important for who who we're hiring today. Um, you know, they the uh, kind of stereotypical kind of sell the technology and move it on renegades uh, salesperson, I think, is far less interesting to uh, to software sales these days. So we definitely are looking for people who are going to be able to have strategic conversations are comfortable with, you know, the conversations around business outcomes as much as they're comfortable with the conversation around technology mm -hmm. um, and are really willing to, you know, partner with with a customer in ways um, that maybe, you know, historically wasn't as as uh, much of a need. Got it, got it. If, Go I were to, if I were to build on one point Paula made, I do think one thing to keep in mind for a product-led growth strategy, which is which is powerful in many respects in the, uh, in the organic flywheel it can create, is bear in mind that as the solution footprint grows within a customer, and at some stage, you want to have a conversation with an executive about significantly growing the footprint. Uh, the executive is going to want to think in, not in product terms, but in in business outcome terms. For sure. And sometimes that can be a challenge if if the organization is wired around mm -hmm. product and technology, right? Meaning there can there can very easily be a disconnect between the marketing, which is product focused and technology focused, and then the executive conversation, which needs to be problem or outcome focused. That, that's a that's a super, super good point. Um, how do you maybe think about the resource allocation uh, of an organization? Because there's more, as you mentioned, more possibly marketing resources, right? Um, and, and possibly bigger marketing team, but at the same time you need, um, you know, sellers who are still outcome focused, business focused, um, how, how should we think about the, the resource distribution for such a model? Go ahead, Bill. I was going to say, I don't know that there's a one size fits all yeah. answer. I mean, I, you know, I try to, I would think about this on a spectrum, maybe on the far end of the spectrum at scale, you'd think about a business like Atlassian, mm -hmm. which got to, you know, many billion dollars in turnover without really having a sales function at all. It was entirely product-led growth. And now, interestingly enough, at scale, they're trying to introduce a more traditional enterprise ser sales-served motion on top of the product-led motion. Um, and then you have organizations on the other side of the spectrum that are entirely in a traditional model. I, I think for me, it's about the, the founding team or the leadership team evaluating where are we really? What are the product characteristics? Um, does it lend itself to a product-led growth approach? And, you know, and if so, what's the right mix of marketing, selling, success? And, you know, and I just would double down on the importance of success in most of the cloud and SaaS businesses I've been exposed to. Yeah, I, I completely agree with, with what Bill was putting forward in the sense that um, the product-led growth motion can continue to help you build demand um, throughout an enterprise organization. And then at some point that when that demand is at a level of materiality, uh, that company is going to want to have an enterprise discussion with you. And, and, you know, that's where you can then, you know, point the sales resource that you have. But, um, there has to be fluidity across the organization as well in terms of the roles that people play. And I would, I would say, especially so the earlier stage that you're in, which is to mean that, you know, the, the customer journey is not linear. It's not like you identify an opportunity, you know, marketing gets them jazzed, hands it over to sales, sales does their magic, closes the deal. And then, you know, customer success or services is make sure that you have a happy customer. Um, <laughs> that, that's not how it works anymore, right? Especially in software where, you know, most of these, um, most companies are eventually going to become multi-product companies. It might start mm -hmm. as a single product, but you're going to eventually, um, to support your growth, introduce multi-products. And so customers are going to weave in and out of that journey 
you know, multiple times and it's going to go back to marketing at some point and then it's going to come back through sales or customer success is actually going to identify that there's an opportunity and they'll tee up sales. So that that system that Bill referred to earlier um, and have in either resourcing or hiring people that can operate in that system, I think are very critical. Makes 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 a lot of sense. And Paula, you've done uh, a lot of enterprise selling right in your in your career and um, we, we talked this, about this a little bit, which is, you know, now how do you think about hiring, um, especially in this environment? Uh, can we talk about that for, for a minute? And, and I'd love to hear your experience, um, you know, building, building teams and recruiting um, in today's market. Yeah, I, you know, it's, I, I think what's really uh, notable to me in today's market when hiring is how important um, candidates in the sales and go-to-market organization want to understand the bigger mission of the company. Mm -hmm. They want to they know what your purpose is. Uh, they want to understand the value proposition at a company level, you know, and a product level. And so there's, there's just this, you know, real need to satiate that mission and that purpose for a candidate um, before you're ever going to really be able to assess their fit to you. So I, I, I would say, you know, for any of us that are hiring right now, that is so important to be able to articulate the mission and the purpose and how any any individual can dramatically and, you know, immediately affect that the outcome of that. Um, so, you know, that's I kind of the first notable thing that I would I would say. And then you know, I, I think that you just have to think about your customer base. You have to think about what that engagement model looks like. You have to think about what that domain expertise or um, selling expertise might be that you need. And I think that will vary from company to company. Um, and, and so it's it's incumbent on us or incumbent on the people in the audience to understand what, you know, those skill sets are required to to really test for. Absolutely. Bill, anything to add to that? Uh, I'm, I'm just scanning the question list. There's a really good question in here that's related, Joanne, around early stage companies setting the foundation for sales teams, where to start. So I'm happy to I'm happy to pick that let's, up and offer a perspective. Okay. So I, I would my personal point of view is I would start with the seller, and I think what at in the early stage, what you need from a seller is different than what you'll need when you start to get into a highly repeatable motion. At the outset, you need a seller that is entrepreneurial, intellectually curious, jazzed, absolutely jazzed about helping you determine how to take the product or the technology to market, how to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And that's very different than the type of account exec profile you, you will more than likely want as the company gets to a different level of scale. And, uh, and I would encourage the founders to be deeply, deeply involved in the selling process up until the point where you feel like you, you feel confident that you have something that's repeatable. And I think once you feel like you have something that's repeatable from a process standpoint, you know why organizations are buying, what problems they're solving, why they're not buying, um, that's the point at which to start to think about a sales leader. Yeah, absolutely agree. And one of, one of the advice that we give, especially technical founders who are hiring their first salesperson is think of this person almost like a co-founder from a mentality mm -hmm. standpoint. They're an entrepreneur, just like you are. Um, and they have to have the ethos of that first and foremost before understanding sales, right? Yep. Um, now the challenge here is how do you find such a person? <laughs> because if you can find that person, why aren't they going and starting their own company? Mm -hmm. uh, any any thoughts on on where to look? <laughs> well, we've I mean I we've had a lot of luck with uh, with the the digital uh, you know recruiting um, far more than just you know the old world of dialing in your Rolodex and and networking right. I think that um, going and finding out where the talent is hanging out and the conversations that they're having and interjecting your way into those to try and recruit and attract um, can be very effective right now. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's take a maybe we'll take a different audience question. I'll, There's I'll take Sam. I'll take Sammy's question. Oh, um, maybe if, if that's okay, which is you know really around um, companies that might be straddling uh, the PLG with the more um, sales led uh, type of motion, and I'll just relate it again to our experience right now at Altrix. So. 
um, you know, our our business uh, over the last couple of decades was built um, in the lines of business with with analysts that were handling data uh, for the majority of their of their time. We would get them a, a download, a trial, and get them hooked on it, and then it would sort of virally expand from there with often little um, intervention or support required from the sales organization. Uh, that continues today. We don't want to slow that down. That's super important. Um, but what we've also found is that the market for data and analytics is at a point where you know, chief data officers and CIOs are saying, we've got to get a handle on um, all the different technologies that we have in the enterprise. We've got to be thinking about this as an enterprise capability as opposed to something that is, you know, so self-service led that we don't feel we can govern it. We don't know. We don't know who's doing what. We don't know how to secure it. Um, and and now they're wanting to look for, you know, an enterprise solution that services all the different pockets of demand that have been built um, through product-led growth. And so that's an example. We're living it right now, where the two are. They coexist. They're equally important. We could just continue to do the, the PLG, but we might not get the enterprise-wide uh, opportunity if we aren't having the executive conversation uh, and all the accoutrements that come with that uh, that a, a sales organization will usually address. That, that makes sense. Actually, tactically, we we have a follow-up to that, which is you know, when you think about just like where PLG starts. And, and stops um, and, and where does enterprise start and stop? Maybe we can clarify for the audience a bit how you guys have thought about that. Paula, do you want to maybe continue? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, not sure. I may not understand the question um, about starting and stopping because I don't see it as a handoff or <laughs> as like a definitive PLG only addresses this market and sales only addresses that market. At least that's not not the way that I look at it. I, I really do think that one can, you know, one can serve the other and vice versa. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't see a real clear delineation of, of where things would start and stop. But Bill, I welcome your, your way in on this. Well, I do. I think there's a, you know, there's a segmentation consideration, which is on, on some basic level, when and where and why do we want selling teams to engage? And I think that's the question to answer. And the answer is, I think, very situation specific. But one way to think about all these things, Paula, you made this point earlier, is to look at it through the customer's lens. So if you're the customer and you have a product proliferating inside your organization, at what juncture would you as the customer want to slow things down and think about um, what's the maturity model? How do we get value? What kind of support are we going to require uh, to maximize the value? Have we met all of our enterprise security standards, so on and so forth? The logical set of questions that uh, that an account would ask at some juncture. And if you can do that outside in thinking, that in my general experience is a very good place to start in terms of how you think about uh, rules of engagement, when sales teams engage, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. I mean, a related question is, you know, obviously about pricing, right? And this is something that, gosh, like no one gets right. Not in the C, not in the Series A, probably not in the Series D even. Uh, and um, this is something that, you know, every sales organization um, struggles with or, or is, you know, um, is thinking about. Um, how, how have you guys thought about pricing, um, especially as your organization is growing? You have more product modules and yeah. different things. I'd say the first thing is not to think that you are going to get it right or perfect or that it's going to be your pricing model for a considerable amount of time. And I think if you kind of take that pressure and burden off of yourself, it sort of frees you up to move with speed. Um, so I, I would say that's an important thing to recognize up front. Secondly, I, I would always encourage you to engage customers in that conversation. You, you can test your ideas before you launch your pricing uh, and you will get um, nothing less than candid feedback from them in terms of how that does or doesn't resonate with them. Um, you know, and then thirdly, you, you, you want to be thinking about, you know, what is, what is it that you deliver value on? If you're able to um, boil down what your value is to 
um, a unit, a metric, um, or a package in some way, uh, that will usually tell you how you should initially start, um, you know, releasing your pricing because that's going to be easy for your customers to understand. If you have a sales organization, it's going to be easier for them to articulate it because it's tied to value. Um, and then lastly, it probably gives you the best growth opportunity uh, as well. So um, those are my high level thoughts, but don't think you'll get it right because you won't and you'll have to change it. <laughs> that's right. It will evolve forever. That's the, right. other, Go ahead. the other quick thought I would add, keep the pricing as simple and understandable as you possibly can. Again, if you think about it from the customer standpoint in SaaS, as an example, customers understand users and they understand consumption. Generalizing anything beyond those two concepts causes confusion and confusion can lead to distrust. The, the two uh, pieces of feedback customers will give you if they're unhappy with the pricing model is A, I don't understand it or B, it's not transparent. So try to try to avoid those things from the outset as you think about pricing. And you want to tie that to business outcomes at some point in time during this process as well. Yes, I think you need to be able to articulate how I don't know that the pricing necessarily needs to tie to business outcomes, but you certainly need to be be able to explain for an investment of X, there's some business outcome that's 10 X or more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, speaking of, um, uh, of, of this topic, one of, one of the, um, uh, very, you know, popular questions that, that we keep getting is, Hey, what, what are, what are CROs thinking about? Like what kind of solutions, do they want? Do they want to buy? <laughs> if, if a startup founder is is thinking about building software that serve you guys for some kind of you know business outcome, um, what's top of mind? What are you looking for in terms of tools? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, sales is uh, and go to market is a, a mix of art and science. I think I think I saw that actually outlined in one of the questions in the comments. Um, I do think for far too long, uh, we have been guilty of letting it be too artful. <laughs> um, and as you scale, um, that repeatability um, is so important. And so the more um, insights that can be brought forward, you know, through AI or ML or through, you know, visibility um, to the data sets that we manage our business with, um, those are going to be really interesting to us uh, as CROs because uh, you know we're on the hook for for growth and um, you know that visibility into repeatable uh, motions that will drive growth is definitely top of mind. Got it. Got it. And Bill. Well, I agree with I agree with that, Paula. Uh, the other thing I would add, generally, I think that you know the secret to scalability and performance in most go to market models is the productivity of the base selling unit. Mm -hmm. which is you know, some amount of marketing, a seller, some amount of customer success. And so solutions that drive that, I think, have exceptional value for a CRO. Um, one example, it, I think, is outreach, right? The fun, I think the fundamentally what makes outreach valuable is it's so, there are a lot of things I like about outreach, including the data. But what drives value is the fact that it helps the seller or the SDR be more productive. It helps them do their job more effectively, achieve more, uh, achieve more per unit of time, create more revenue, so on and so forth. So those are the kinds of problems I would I would look to solve if I were if I were in a founder mindset. And there, there are a number of tools that are helping with this general thesis of productivity for, for your seller units. How does one get your attention? How did outreach get your attention specifically? Um, what, 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 how, anything to think about in terms of their pitches or if they write you an email? Like how, how do you get, get your attention amongst this sea of, of options? Well, I, it's a really good question. I mean, what, what ultimately gets my attention is some some subset of my organization having success with a with a tool or technology right that that's what would cause me to lean in and say wait a second what kind of outcome would could, could we create if we could scale this across the go to market yeah um and it's hard for me you know and it, 
we're at 600 million in revenue run rate. So not a, not a giant company yet, but also not small enough. It, it, it's hard. It would be hard for me to take the personal time to go invest it, investigate a piece of technology and, and, and form a personal opinion on, is it something we should explore or not explore? So I, you know, I would encourage earlier stage companies find some, find someone in an organization like mine or like Paula's who can spend the time with you and, and who can help you demonstrate that there's a productivity win or a cost win or a conversion rate win. And typically, if you can then go substantiate that, that's how you would get attention of someone at our level. Yeah, that, that's right. I, the, the, which would underscore that product-led growth can be super valuable in that regard, right? Because if you can find people within our organization, and I, I've had the same experience that Bill has, most of the, the, the last couple of investments that I've made were, were ideas that my team brought to me because they had tested it and they saw value in their business. Uh, and then they were kind of willing to be the sponsor for it to you know help help the rest of the organization get on board. Um, so I think it, it validates that uh, you know quite a bit. And, and sometimes salespeople are the easiest people to sell to because we understand the play. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, uh, that's good. I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience are gonna be pinging you guys or <laughs> our reports now. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Well, let's, let's, you know, we're, we're almost at time. We just have a couple of minutes left and I want to leave just the rest of the time to talk about some of the advice that you may have for early stage founders as they think about scaling their, their sales organization. Any, any main learnings that you have that you want to pass on? Well, maybe we'll start with you, Paula. Yeah, I want to double down on the the word focus that um, that Bill used earlier. I think that you know being deliberate about um, who your ideal customer profiles are, uh, what market fit you're looking to validate, uh, and where you want to invest your very precious resources. Um, make that a very deliberate decision, uh, focus and be, you know, relentlessly committed to that and, you know, avoid the, uh, the temptation to add more things onto the plate. Um, uh, if, you know, you, you, as you make your first hire or two in the sales organization, make sure that, um, that that individual or set of people are really, really active, um, in, in every aspect of the business, you know, not just the conversations with the customers and trying to position it, but that they really understand the development cycle and they really understand, um, you know, the back office elements of your business, because the more they understand the, in a, the, the, uh, the way the business is run, the better that they can, you know, be a, a steward of it to your customers. Um, so those are some of my parting thoughts um, for you. Great, great advice. And Bill, final words of wisdom. Focus on people. Yeah. Ensure you're building a team that reflects the culture that you want to operate with. Ensure that as you build different parts of the go-to-market, that they're treating customer relationships as precious, that they're listening to the customer, that they're gleaning all the insight that that great customers are willing to share. You know, sometimes sometimes with a smile, sometimes with sterner comments. And if, if you listen to the teams you build and you listen to, the, to, to your customers and partners and you act on the things they tell you, good things happen. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both so much for being here with us today. Uh, I learned a ton and I, I think our audience did too. Uh, really appreciate the insights and you may hear from some of them, especially as they start companies um, that sell into sales. Um, we really appreciate the time and thank you again. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks so much. Enjoyed it.